you are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. America, right now, you and I, who live in America, those of you that live in the European Union or one of the nations associated or formally associated with the European Union, those of you that live in the Middle East, Asian nations, South America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, wherever you live in the world, but now you're listening to the Paul McGuire Report, which broadcasts from Southern California, the epicenter of chaos. And I would say LA is the epicenter of chaos. Ever since we've been broadcasting from Southern California, which has been decades, we have been besieged with massive uh, fires that look like some kind of biblical uh, catastrophe. From the book of Revelation. Fires that are so intense that they, that they, they threaten to engulf the, the building that I'm in and, and nearby buildings. Every day in California now, and southern, just Southern California alone, not to mention Northern California and other states, the sky is so filled with soot that the sun becomes orange, the moon becomes orange. I remember going to bed last night feeling okay, waking up, <clears throat> not being able to talk because of the hoarseness in my chest, super inflamed sinuses, all due to, to the thickness of the toxic smoke from the toxic fires um, going into your lungs and your eyes and, 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 you know, doing what I can in terms of praying staying indoors and taking certain supplements. But that's just part of it. I've lived through uh, a whole series of earthquakes. Most of these earthquakes would terrify you. If you had not been in an earthquake area, any one of these earthquakes would have terrified you. But I was literally in two of the biggest earthquakes. And one was the uh, Northridge earthquake. And then along with the Northridge earthquake, it had a dual epicenter, which means two centers. And the second center was in the uh, uh, area of Santa Clarita, where we lived at the time. And it sounded like a locomotive train going full blast smashed through the living room wall, and the house shook so violently, I was convinced that it was going to collapse at any second. My wife grabbed our three kids. They were like two three-year-olds and a four-year-old, like the bionic woman, fired up on, on super adrenaline. And I attempted to help her at, at the stairs. And we ran out of our house before we thought it was going to collapse and gathered on our driveway at the end of the cul-de-sac where all the lights were out, no media whatsoever, uh, no AM or FM radio stations, just pitch black sky with stars. And our neighbors began to come out in blankets and, and lawn chairs and stuff. And a barrage of my neighbors, Jewish neighbors, non-believing neighbors, humanistic neighbors, and they all spontaneously asked me this question. I, I did not bring it up. I didn't bring it up at all. They said, Paul, and they were pointing to the earthquake devastation all around us, a home, one home next to mine at this time, literally, it's split in two. So when you walk through the door, you would see this one to two foot chasm. And who knows how far down into the earth that chasm went. And literally, my neighbor's home, including its foundation, had broken into two halves. Other buildings came completely down. And physically, many of you would know where we were located at that time, because most of you remember seeing that those photographs and, the, and that video footage of those cars that were stuck up on, on these giant freeways. And these giant aerial freeways had broken uh, in two and separated. 
uh, and, and there was a car stuck like on an island in between uh, the front and the back, and he was trapped, and the freeways completely collapsed. You saw those pictures. They were so weird. And then the aftershocks went on for a year. I'm talking about every day. Once that initial earthquake went off with the dual epicenter, every half hour, every hour or more, there would be uh, an aftershock, which would shake everything violently once again. We all slept out in the lawn, so none of us wanted to have our houses collapse on ourselves. It was at that point, the time of the Northridge earthquake, um, that I made a decision. I had so many unsaved neighbors come up to me who knew I was a Christian author who who had written many books. And some of the books back then I had written were already on Bible prophecy. So in 1995, um, with a copyright of 1996, I wrote a book called The End Times Have Begun, From Earthquakes to Global Unity. And in this book, I wrote this book based on all these people talking to me after this massive earthquake. And they asked me specifically, these were Jewish guys in the entertainment industry and people in all kinds of industries, but they weren't Christians. They knew a little bit about Bible prophecy. They had seen me on the History Channel because I was featured on a whole series of uh, History Channel specials like uh, uh, Seven Signs of the Apocalypse or The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which aired over and over and over again for uh, over a decade, where I was one of the feature uh, experts and Bible prophecy authors interviewed. They had seen me on those shows. So they, they came up to me and they said, Paul, are these the signs of the times that Jesus Christ talked about? And I had strangers come up to me in stores when I was getting gasoline or whatever. And, and you know, in the course of the conversation or in between aftershocks, they would say to me inevitably, are these the signs of the times that Jesus Christ talked about? Is this Paul? Is this the end of the world? Is this the end of the age that the Bible talks about? And I was stunned that the vast majority of people who asked me these questions were not Christians. They didn't read their Bibles, but they had an intuitive knowing that these were the signs of the times. And so, uh, even though I had written Bible prophecy books before, I decided to devote my ministry. Uh, to center around not only winning souls for Christ and being a Bible teacher, but specifically communicating and teaching salvation, redemption, how to be born again through Bible prophecy. I, I decided to focus in on the topic of Bible prophecy because I was being inundated with people who wanted to know answers and who were not believers. And so in my book, The end times have begun from earthquakes to global unity. And uh, Reverend Jack Van Impey, he bought like 50,000, 50 to 80,000, 50 to 100,000 copies of this book and distributed it worldwide. Uh, And in this book, I talk about all kinds of things. And the copyright is, once again, 1996. And um, I have chapters like Big Brother is Watching You, uh, Will the Russian Bear Move South, Future Warfare, Spiritual Deception, um, The Days of Noah, a whole lot of shaking going on, what on earth is happening. And um, then I talk about the statistical, scientific, measurable increase in the amount of earthquakes um, as, a, as a prophetic super sign. Okay, so let me read you something from this book, because this book changed my life, because I went through it, and then I wrote about it, and this book has reached the message of this book by God's grace alone, and because of the sensitivity of uh, uh, Dr. Jack Van Impey, this, the, the message of this book, the prophetic message of this book, 
along with the message of the gospel. This book, uh, From Earthquakes to Global Unity, that I wrote, has reached over a million people, a million souls for Christ. So let me read you a little bit of it. Chapter 2, a whole lot of shaking going on. It was around 4 a.m. in our house in northern Los Angeles County. My wife had gotten up because she couldn't sleep as, and was in the process of what I thought was going through some files. She was upstairs, and I thought I heard her drop a large box. Quite, quite frankly, I was beginning to get irritated because she was making so much noise so early in the morning. However, these thoughts had not even passed through my mind when it sounded as if she had dropped a whole truckload of boxes. At that very second, the house began to shake so violently that my first thought was that a thermonuclear weapon had gone off and we had just been hit by the blast. All of my thoughts were split-second pulses of disoriented reason. As the next 30 seconds seemed like an hour, since I had been in Southern California for almost two decades, I did not think this was an earthquake at the time. Yet the house began to shake so violently that I thought the roof was going to cave in any second, and I was preparing to run upstairs to grab my children. However, I was being thrown around the room. In another pulse-like thought, I realized this was a massive earthquake on a scale I had never dreamed of. It was like being stuck in the Steven Spielberg movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Then, in a second, it resided, and I shouted with all my strength to my wife upstairs, Grab the kids! Yet, like a fearless bionic woman, mobilized by the chemical fury of a super adrenaline high, the kind that only a total crisis can bring on, my wife had grabbed all three of our young children, and was heading down the stairs where she met me. I grabbed two children, and we bolted from the house. We headed for the driveway to scramble for safety. As we shivered outside, suddenly all the lights of the city went out, and our neighbors began to run out of their homes. I was shivering in a t-shirt and underwear when the night sky became a dark blue, and a billion bright stars appeared now that the light of the city had gone. It was a strange feeling to stand there in the aftermath of a massive earthquake and to see the night stars brighter than I had seen them before. There were, there with civilization eclipse, the great expanse of the universe overshadowed us. Moments later, there were about 50 neighbors huddled in blankets in our driveway waiting in a terrified anticipation as the aftershocks continued. A car radio blasted the news in the night that the city had just experienced a powerful 6.7 earthquake that had plunged Los Angeles into total darkness. One Hollywood comedian described his experience of going through the Northridge earthquake like waking up in a blending machine drunk because the early morning shaking was so violent and unexpected. And then I continue on um, about the, the prophetic super signs that are accelerating in America and around the world. Now, that was the North Ridge earthquake, okay? And in my book, um, the end times have begun from earthquakes to global unity. I'm not trying to sell it to you. I don't have any more copies. I have this story in an expanded version in A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2. Um, that, that goes to even further detail, which you can get at paulmcguire.us. So my neighbors, who were not saved, um, had heard of the term, the signs of the times and the end of the age. And this is, this is what I wrote in the book. I quote from the New Testament. I quote the exact words of Jesus Christ, where Jesus says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these, must come, all these things must come to pass. 
but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he or she who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then will the end come. Now, the point that I want to make here is that um, since the Northridge earthquake, I have now written a total of 34 books. The vast majority of them are on Bible prophecy and interpreting current and global events through the lens of the Bible and specifically Bible prophecy. And I've learned through my studies and through my research, you know, I just don't make stuff up, that some of the weather may be due to natural weather changes and conditions, okay? But Jesus Christ in the Bible warns specifically about tsunamis, freak weather, droughts, famines, pandemics, uh, uh, war between different ethnic groups, ethnos, or race wars. Jesus Christ warns about race wars and diseases and droughts and spiritual deception on a level we've never seen before. Now, that happened, began before uh, the North Ridge earthquake. In fact, I would say that with the coming of what God calls his prophetic super sign, which is the rebirth of the modern nation of Israel in Jerusalem, and when the Jews return to Israel, and the nation of Israel is miraculously reborn in 1948, that begins the, the, what is called the countdown uh, to Armageddon, which, by the way, is the title of another book I wrote on Bible prophecy. And again, I'm not trying to sell you that book because it's, it's been out of stock, um, Countdown to Armageddon. But again, in my books, of volumes one and two of A Prophecy of the Future of America, the book Are You Ready? The book The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World and the Day the Dollar Died, I recap and go into greater detail dealing with all that kind of intense information. Information which integrates Bible prophecy with um, current events and what's happening in our nation. Now, right now, it said, what I quoted in my book, From Earthquakes to Global Unity, where I went through the earthquake, Jesus Christ warned that one of the Prophetic super signs of the last days was that the love of many would grow cold. Jesus Christ was specifically talking about the, the normal love between a, a mother and her children, or normal love between a mother and a uh, husband and wife, uh, friendship, family, that, that, that normal love, um, and also true Christian love, which is called the agape love of Jesus Christ. Our world, the American society, Western culture, um, because of its spiritual retardation, if you will, does not have a sufficient vocabulary to describe what the love of God is and how the love of God, the agape love of Jesus Christ, is different than so-called normal human kinds of love, like um, uh, filial love, which is, uh, I mispronounced it, only because, only because I'm trying to rush through certain complexity here, but 
the love you have, mother, father, husband, wife, what the love you have for children, your neighbors, that's a, a normal kind of human love. And then agape love is can only be produced by the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Agape love is the only true spiritual love which doesn't seek to satisfy itself. Agape love is always willing to lay down its life for somebody else, like Jesus Christ laid down his life and died upon a cross for our sins. And then finally, um, there's the form, the form of love that deals with romantic or sexual love, which is really all about lust. It's what can, instead of what can I do to serve somebody else, uh, lust um, is a kind of love which is all about what can that other person do to satisfy me. It's all about me. How can that other person satisfy my romantic uh, uh, desires? How can that other person uh, satisfy my sexual desires or my ego desires? And that's all in the category of a kind of uh, love, which is called eros or erotic love. Erotic love or eros is sexual, physical, romantic love. And it is always based on, you say, in, in our popular culture, people say, oh, I'm in love with that person, I'm in love with that person. But what they really mean is I'm in lust with that person. Because that person is only useful. They only have that feeling, feeling, transitory feeling of being in love as long as they are experience a, a kind of lust or a powerful sexual attraction known as eros or erotic love. But most forms of love talked about in American and Western societies are based on the emotional love of friends, of family, brothers, sisters, cousins, or it's based on erotic or romantic love. And then the rarer kind of love is the agape love of Jesus Christ, where you're willing. It's a product, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Christ lives in you, and because Christ lives in you, you're not seeking to just satisfy yourself. You're seeking, first of all, to, to love. You're, you're willing to die to yourself, to your desires, so that you can free somebody else. You're willing to die to your own needs and desires in order to liberate somebody else. That's what true love is, see? That's what true love is. And Jesus Christ demonstrated this agape love when he deliberately died on a cross and took the penalty for our sins upon himself on the cross. He was crucified. That's the ultimate act of agape love. And when the Bible tells us to pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus, what it means is we are to, through faith in Christ and through faith, pick up our cross and be willing to die by faith spiritually to our wants, our desires, our needs, and by faith make God's desires, God's needs, God's love, our top priority. So we're not living self-centered lives, we're living Christ-centered lives. Now why this is important is this, this is, this is biblical theology 101. This is like understanding, how to understand the New Testament and the Old Testament 101. It's, you, you can't grow in the Christian life unless you master this primary truth. And the primary truth is that it's not all about you, <clears throat> it's about Jesus. Jesus is Lord, and you worship and, and serve Jesus, whether, whether it causes you pleasure or causes you pain. You see, your willingness to be an obedient ser- ser- uh, servant to Jesus Christ will set you free. But many times in the Christian life, God is going to require of you to literally pick up your cross, and 
die to yourself, die to your desires, and to pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. That's how you liberate yourself and you liberate other people. It's not self-centered love. Okay, so what we have to understand is right now, these signs of the times are raging in America and around the world. And so one of the things we notice, people talk about the fact that the love of many has grown cold. So in previous generations, see, this is, this is why it is absolutely critical, absolutely vital, that we as Christians should be living our lives controlled and filled by the Holy Spirit And it is essential that we, as Christians, learn how to pick up our crosses and die to ourselves so that we can love others with the agape love of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely essential. And Jesus said that that the lives of believers were supposed to be like salt and light in a dark and dying spiritual world. That means our lives should have so much of the inner transformation of Jesus Christ produced by the power of the Holy Spirit that when we interact with other people or institutions or governments or organizations or churches, when we interact with this world system, there is something different about us in our inner man or woman that only the Spirit of God can produce the Holy Spirit. And people sense that, they react to that, And we are salt. And Jesus said, when the salt loses its ability to make food taste good, when the salt has lost its savor, which means it's it's salt that doesn't make food taste good, it doesn't have any effect. Also, you know, you can store food a long time by by placing lots of salt around it. It it functions as an antibacterial agent. But when we, as the Church of Jesus Christ, lose our saltiness before a dying and lost culture, we no longer flavor, if you will, the rest of the culture with biblical values, loving one another as Christ loved us, absolute right, absolute wrong, biblical values, the Holy Spirit, moral right, moral wrong, virtue, faithfulness, all the things that, all the positive forces that hold a healthy nation or society together when the church is functioning properly like salt and light, that impacts all of society as a widespread, pervasive healing agent. When the church is truly worshiping Jesus, truly reading the Word of God, truly picking up their crosses and following Jesus Christ, this, this has a ricochet effect, and it, 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 it echoes in every dimension of society, and it, it, it causes people's behavior who are not Christians to be influenced by Christ, to be influenced by God, to be influenced by the Word of God, because our lives are salty, and we affect the critical mass of the population. Our very presence and our behavior and our thoughts and choices have a secondary effect of bringing people closer to God. In addition, uh, we are the light of the world. So we are salt and light. And again, you've heard me tell this story, but it's so powerful. My wife, Christina, and I, and I've been married to my lovely wife, Christina, for <clears throat> over 40 years. and. Um, When we were first dating, right near the World Trade Center towers, the the, the two towers, the original ones, uh, and right near Madison Square Garden in Manhattan, there was, across the street, there was this giant auditorium, I forgot the name of it, and we went there because we heard that Corey Ten Boom was going to speak there. Now, some of you know who she is, some of you don't. Corey Ten Boom, um, along with her sister, lived in one of the Scandinavian countries. I I, I believe she was Dutch. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe she was Dutch. In any case, when the Nazis 
violently, when Adolf Hitler and the Nazis violently took over her nation, they began to arrest and imprison and massacre in the concentration camps uh, Jews, uh, Christians, Protestants, anybody that would speak out against Adolf Hitler, and specifically Jews, were sent off to the concentration camps where they were burnt alive or they were gassed to death by the millions. Now, Corey Ten Boom and their family, they, you know, you hear, you hear Christians spout what I call nonsensical theology. Well, Cor- Corey Ten Boom's family was not nonsensical. They were real Christians. So what they did is they had some close Jewish friends, and they hid an entire Jewish family in the attic and between the walls of their house, including Corey Ten Boom and her sister. So for, I don't know how long, a year or so, they successfully hid a family of Jews in the walls of their house or in in the roof area. So whenever the the SS troops would stop by and inspect the house, by God's grace, they never found the Jews that were being hidden there by this devoutly Christian family who risked their lives to save the Jews that they had hidden. Well, anyway, somebody made a mistake, and one day, not only did the Jews get taken away to concentration camps, but Corrie ten Boom and her sister were taken away by the Nazi soldiers to a concentration camp because they committed the crime of harboring or hiding Jews, which gave a sentence of a death sentence or life imprisonment in a concentration camp. So the next thing you know, Corrie Ten Boom and her sister are in a Nazi concentration camp for the crime of hiding Jews, because they were real Christians. They, they had the agape love of Jesus Christ. And um, Corrie Ten Boom's sister dies in the concentration camp because it's so brutal. Miraculously, Corrie Ten Boom survives the ordeal of the concentration camp. And then her testimony becomes famous. She writes a best-selling book on her experience. (laughs) Billy Graham produced a uh, a full-length feature film that was seen by millions of people called The Hiding Place, uh, featuring Corey Ten Boom. And the novel, not the novel, the book was called The Hiding Place. In fact, in Times Square, New York, excuse me, uh, where I was ministering and promoting Christian concerts at the Lambs Club on 44th Street and Broadway. There were a number of Broadway theaters on 44th Street, but also we sponsored, along uh, with the Billy Graham organization, I uh, organized, uh, along with other people at the Lambs Club, I organized a partnership between our ministry <coughs> and the Billy Graham organization. And so <clears throat> we rented a giant movie theater, which aired uh, The Hiding Place, <clears throat> and uh, people it would stay in the theater for like months, packed crowds, because the story was so riveting. She finally survived and came to America to tell her story. And it was a warning. It was a warning to American Christians that eventually American Christians could face being arrested by a totalitarian regime for being true Christians. And I'll be honest with you, I remember being so <clears throat> so gripped by this movie, The Hiding Place, but also so disturbed because I could see pictorially uh, how America, this is, this is 40 years ago, I could see how America was incrementally, inch by inch, slowly morphing in to a Nazi-like totalitarian regime. Although 40 years ago, it was very subtle. To anyone who knows history, you could see, the, for lack of better better words, the Nazi-esque qualities that were starting to originate in America. And it was very frightening for Christians. It was also a very sobering message because Ori Ten Boom her family, they got killed. Millions of Christians who tried to, to hide the Jews got killed and murdered and tortured. And the Jews got killed and murdered and tortured. 
Corey's life was spared. And so she came to the United States and spoke to give this warning to American Christians. So my wife and I attended this giant event with Corey Ten Boom, this giant uh, theater. And Corey Ten Boom was speaking. And I'll never forget, she, she told uh, the organizers of the event to turn off all the lights in this giant auditorium. So here you are, we were sitting in this giant auditorium, probably with like 25,000 seats, and it was pitch black. And then Corey Ten Boom, from, hidden from behind her speaking podium, she takes out a match, Corey Ten Boom lights one single, tiny, solitary candle. And the glow from that one single, solitary candle, not much bigger than a birthday candle, that glow from that one candle lit up the lit up the darkness of the entire room. It doesn't mean the room was like bright, but it means that the, the, the light produced by one candle was enough to take us, the audience members, out of the darkness, and we could see doorways and shapes and seats, and and we could we could see our reality. It just took one candle to light up this massive dark room. And then as Corrie Ten Boom was doing this, she was recounting the purpose of her life in the concentration camps, and she was instilling in the audience the biblical truth that uh, the darkness has never, the spiritual darkness has never conquered the light, and that the light will always conquer the darkness. And, and her visual aid in, in, in sending us this message was so powerful. Tears came to your eyes. Here was this elderly woman. I don't know how old she was, but she was quite old by then. She had survived the horrors of a concentration camp. Her daughter had died, not daughter, her sister had died in the concentration camp. Many of the Jews she loved had died in the concentration camp. But she was warning American Christians because. Another part of the message of the movie and her speech was that sometimes there are events that happen that you have no control over, and that when, th when that time comes, you're going to need to know how to trust God with your faith, even though with your eyes and your experiences, it may look hopeless. But she instilled in every one of us that even though it looks hopeless, that in Jesus Christ it is never hopeless. And again, she reminded us that the light, um, that the, excuse me, that the darkness has never conquered the light. And it was very moving. But I was, I must admit, I was moved, a great respecter of Corey Ten Boom, met her afterwards. But I was also a little bit annoyed. I was annoyed. Because I was saying, God, and I was thinking about fatalism. This was, this was 40 years ago I was thinking about fatalism. And I kept saying to myself, Lord, it can't possibly be your will to just nonchalantly allow millions of Christians in America and other places to go to concentration camps or re-education camps and to be killed by the millions. It can't possibly be your will. Because to me, I felt that inadvertently, not intentionally, the film was essentially communicating a message of, well, just resign yourself to your fate. It's fatalism. Um, you know, God planned for you to go through the concentration camp, and he'll be with you in the concentration camp. And I, I, was, I was, to be honest, kind of annoyed at that message because it was a fatalistic message. And what was haunting my heart was this, and I kept crying out to God, after seeing this movie, and I'm saying, Lord, if your people before the concentration camp, before the Nazi takeover, if your, if your people, let's say, in Holland or other places, if they were to have taken a stand and not have been cowards, if they were to have proudly and boldly shined the light of Jesus Christ, if they would have stood up in a peaceful, law-abiding manner and actively resisted in a law-abiding man manner, the, the concentration camps, the persecution of Jews and Christians, 
it would never have come down to Corey Tim Boom's sister being murdered and this horrible Holocaust. In other words, I was saying to God, God, is, is the message you're trying to give your people from this film that we should be prepared to die to ourselves, pick up our cross and follow Jesus? that we should rely on Christ to give us strength supernaturally uh, and, and go into a concentration camp? Is that what you're trying to tell your people? And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain around that. That seemed ridiculous. It seemed, why bother to warn God's people if you can't do anything about it? And Corey Ten Boom, one of the main tenets of her message was that you may not feel ready now, but when the time comes... I forgot her exact words, some of you may remember it. You will be supernaturally strengthened and supernaturally equipped to be victorious if you're taken into a concentration camp. All right? But this troubled me deeply because I kept saying to the Lord, Lord, if your people, if in Nazi Germany, if the Christians had stopped playing church, if they had stopped, stopped, if they had stopped not believing in the Word of God, if the Christians in Germany and Holland had risen and taken a stand for freedom, freedom of religion, uh, protecting the Jews, protecting the Christians from the concentration camps, if the people had really taken a hard, firm stand and spoken out aggressively and in a law-abiding, peaceful manner and drew a line in the sand and really uh, um, threw the gauntlet down and said, no, enough is enough, and we're not apathetic, and we're activistic instead, I said, Lord, couldn't this horror have been averted? I said, Lord, isn't this horror, the concentration camp, the Corey Ten Boom story, isn't this horror, God, a form of judgment indirectly from you upon your people because in the time of trial, they were disobedient to you, God. They, they hid. Corey Ten Boom's family hid the Jews, but most, most Christian families were just hiding themselves. They didn't speak out. They hid. They, they voted Hitler into the office of prime minister. They publicly supported Adolf Hitler, and they publicly went along with the Nazi program, all which was disobedience to God. If they had actually confronted Hitler, and took a stand, most likely Hitler would have backed down and millions of people would not have been tortured, killed, and slaughtered in the concentration camps. And so that movie impacted me very deeply, as many other events deeply impacted me when I was a young Christian. Remember, when I saw this movie, I had just come to Christ as my Lord and Savior about a year and a half earlier. So this movie had an impact on me, but the impact that it had on me was not necessarily the impact that I believe the directors intended or the writers intended. What God was saying to me through The Hiding Place was, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven heal their land. And so what God was saying to me is if God's people in America, that started back then, and it applies to what's happening right now, at this second, at this moment in history. If God's people, in the face of chaos, in the face of riots, in the face of, you know, random shootings, yesterday uh, uh, a shooter walked up to a parked police car I don't know if they lived through it or not, brutally shot two policemen for no reason. And what you're seeing in the behavior, the actions, the training, the violent activities, the usage of propaganda, the usage of chaos, the usage of crisis, what you're seeing among these armies of the night, uh, the Antifa movement and the uh, Black Lives Matter and the uh, other socialist, Marxist, communist revolutionary groups. What they're doing in terms of their street theater and their violence and their manipulation of chaos 
is step for step an imitation of what the Nazis did step by step when they when the Nazis deliberately initiated chaos, death, riots, demonstration, and crisis in European nations and in the nation nation of Germany. These current demonstrators in our streets that are killing, shooting, etc., they are using the exact same tactics employed by the Nazi youth, the Nazi demonstrators, the Nazi party. None of this is original stuff that they're doing. They're simply copying the blueprint or the plans that the Nazis used to gain power, that Hitler used to gain power. And then in communist nations, under communist dictators like Lenin, Stalin, and China's Chairman Mao, they use the same strategies of crisis and chaos and mass slaughter and shooting and terror. You see, all these communist revolutions, these Marxist revolutions, these socialist revolutions, these Nazi national socialist revolutions, they all operate according to the same handbook or the same principles or the same playbook. And so if anyone had bothered to study history and you're looking at what's happening now on television, you're seeing the weird response by the politicians. This, this happened before in history. The politicians, whether they know it or not, are doing everything they can <clears throat> to empower the growth of these violent Antifa, Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> anarchist groups, and other radical groups. Whether they realize it or not, <clears throat> they are making the same exact historical mistakes <clears throat> that the uh, people made when they confronted the Nazi demonstrators and the radical communist demonstrators in Russia. <clears throat> they're, they're falling into the same exact trap. <clears throat> and the result will be the same. At the end of the day, all the politicians who were fearful and cowardly and gave in to the dictatorial demands of the violent communist radicals <clears throat> and the violent socialist Marxist radicals and the violent Nazi radicals, what the politicians did in Nazi Germany in terms of appeasing these radicals, funding the radicals, the same mistakes are tragically being made now. And therefore, if, we can, if you know history at all, a little bit about history, you know that we are, and our leaders especially, they are repeating step by step the same fatal, catastrophic mistakes that were made in previous generations, which allowed for the takeover by a Nazi dictatorship, the takeover of a communist dictatorship, Marxist dictatorship, and socialist dictatorship. The result of those takeovers was collectively, and, and communists loved to hide the true numbers. Read my books, get the, get the four book bundle that consists of uh, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, Conquering the Matrix, which deals with scientific mind control and how to break it. Um, um, Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2. Mass Awakening, which talks about how to engineer a mass violent communist awakening, or how to ignite a biblical, spiritual third great awakening, which will spread love and heal our nation. The choice is up to you and me. And the ordinary Christian, pastors, seminary heads, and our leaders, our politicians, both on the left and the right. <clears throat> but right now, if you know anything about history, our leaders are being deceived because they're ignorant of history and they're falling into the exact same traps that the 
Nazis and the communists fell into. Now, what happened after the leaders fell into the traps and began funding the radical groups with hundreds of millions of dollars, never forget that all these radical revolutions, the communist revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, the Marxist revolutions, <clears throat> the, the National Socialist Nazi revolutions, all of these revolutions were financed with hundreds of millions of dollars, train loads filled with gold bars, train loads filled with pallets stacked with millions and millions of dollars, uh, endlessly long uh, trail, uh, railroads with, with uh, cars connecting, winding through the mountains of Europe, and these train cars carry massive stockpiles of bullets, ammunition, bombs, terrorist soldiers, uh, fire bombs, uh, all kinds of weapons, uh, landmines, uh, cannons, uh, assault rifles. And what happened was <clears throat> the, the communist revolutionary leaders like Trotsky and uh, Lenin uh, they, they were sent on these trains to go through the mountains of Europe into Russia, and they had with them hundreds of millions of dollars in cash. And that, th those hundreds of millions of dollars in cash came from the super wealthy globalist elite international banking families that financed the communist revolutions, financed the Nazi National Socialist Revolution financed the Communist Chinese Revolution. The international bankers, the big investment houses, the wealthiest families in the world, and Wall Street combined together to finance all the communist and Nazi revolutions. Now, you have to know that. If you don't know that, you can't understand history. It's just a blur. But it goes deeper than that. And by the way, there's nothing that I've said to you today on the Paul McGuire Report where I have not provided highly credible documentation uh, in my books, which you can get by taking advantage of the financial discount when you purchase um, a book bundle of my books where you get like four books at a great discount. I document everything I just told you. You've got, you've got to know this is a reality. This is not a game. And the people that should know above everybody else are the pastors, the seminary leaders, the Christian ministry leaders, the Christian Bible teachers, as well as ordinary Christians. They should be the most educated people on this crisis. They should understand uh, the role of watchman ministries like this ministry. We are a watchman ministry. Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, among other things, is a watchman on the wall ministry. We do our homework. <clears throat> we look from a strategic vantage point, and then we blow the trumpet or shofar of alarm because we see the enemy coming to destroy the people of God. Now, when I say that, that's not for the purpose of hype and sensationalism or to manipulate your emotions. I am telling you, step by step, based on documented historical fact, what a communist coup, a Marxist coup, a Nazi coup will look like, and precisely, exactly what it will produce. So don't say that you weren't warned. And you've got to spread this message far and wide. And you have to step into it. And <clears throat> when you spread these messages far and wide, a little note from you on your Facebook or whatever as to why they need to listen, you've got to put that little note. You don't have to write your name, like revealing who you are, but people need to have an icebreaker, okay? That's just the way people are. You know that. You know that. So go to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. I have hundreds of articles for you to read on these subjects. They're illustrated articles in the 
archives at paulmcguire.us. I have hundreds of hours of Bible prophecy teaching, Bible teaching recorded live at Paradise Mountain Church. And you can see the live Paradise Mountain Church meetings and the, the long Bible prophecy messages in detail by simply going to paulmcguire.us and connecting to our Roku channel, which is Paul McGuire Ministries. Roku channel is Paul McGuire Ministries. We also have a Vimeo channel. We also have archives of conferences where I've spoken, uh, TV interviews, uh, the prophetic emergency alerts that we distribute for free are all in video, and the, the, the archives are free for you, uh, located at paulmcguire.us. SoundCloud, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, brighteon.com, and, and join, follow, sign up to all these links and spread them far and wide, because we're dealing with computer bot censorship machines. This is your brother in Christ. we got a spiritual war to win. Not fight, win. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Stand with us at this critical time. Pray like your life depends on it, because it does. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us.